so we are moving on to the next course of business when it comes to blood bank testing. So far we have done ABOs and we've done RHs and we've done weak Ds and we've done direct pooms and we've done antibody screens and we've done reagent QCs. Everybody feel like they're pros? Yes? Sure. sure we do. <laughs> So today we are going to talk about compatibility testing, also known as the cross-match. So all of the testing that you've done up until now um, is the foundation for the compatibility testing. Okay, so everything that, that you're pro at uh, has to be done before you can do the cross-match. It can be done simultaneously in some cases, but have to complete everything before you can dispense blood to a patient to be transfused. Okay. And so that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, a specimen for a cross match is good for 72 hours or midnight on the third day. And that's also for the type and screen. And the reason for that is. Research has found that in 72 hours, a person's immunologic picture can change. Now, that really is only the case if you have to talk about somebody who's been transfused or pregnant. If you talk about somebody who hasn't been transfused or pregnant, if their immunologic picture changes, um, you may detect an antibody that wasn't there before, but it couldn't have been stimulated by anything, so therefore, it would have to be an insignificant antibody. Um, sometimes, sort of like the Lewis A's and B's, the, the people when they're pregnant, during their pregnancy, tend to lose their, their Lewis typing. And so you see, a, you see the Lewis A and B a lot of times in pregnant people, especially black pregnant people. Um, but it's an insignificant antibody. It really has nothing to do with affecting the baby because it's an IgM antibody that doesn't cross the placenta. And just because you see it is more than a nuisance than anything. So the antibodies do play a part, but the fact that you haven't been pregnant or transfused is not going to um, impact whether or not you have a significant antibody. So no pregnancies, no transfusions shouldn't have a significant antibody. If the person says they were never pregnant or transfused, then they have a significant antibody. They have an anti kel or a big E or a A, then obviously they're either um, confused, they're lying, they don't know, Something happened they, they were unaware of. I guess the miscarriage could have happened. But they had to have been exposed to something in order for the antibody to occur. Okay. The only time that the three day rule on specimens, well, there are a couple times that the three day rule on specimens does not apply. One time is if you can attest that um, the person has never been pregnant or transfused, the, the screen basically doesn't have to be repeated ever. But most of the time, nobody's going to do that. They're not going to rely on common knowledge from somebody that may or may not be correct. So most places are going to adhere to that 72 hours or midnight on the third day rule. There may be a few exceptions in some hospitals where they may extend it for surgery patients for having elective surgery or something like that, but for the most part, going to be 72 hours. Um, an infant who is less than four months of age does not have an immune system until they are four months of age, approximately. And so therefore, you really don't have to repeat the screens on the infant until they are four months of age. Now, the one exception to that is if there are maternal antibodies that have crossed the center or are present in the baby system. Then you really do have to do them every three days in order to determine whether the maternal antibody is still there. Once the maternal antibody is gone, dissipated, and is no longer reactive, then you can revert back to the four-month expiration date of the okay. The other part of that is you want to make sure that the units that you are giving the infants are ABO and RH compatible with both the mother and the baby. RH not so much, unless there's anti-D involved, but um, the ABO definitely. So if the baby is an O and the mother is an A, you want to get the baby an A. If the baby is an A and the mother is an O, you still want to get the baby O. Did I say that right? Baby is an O, mother's an A, you want to get the baby O. Baby's an A, mother's an O, you want to get the baby O. 
Okay, so you want to be compatible with both of them. The mother has anti big C, and the anti big C is in the baby system. You want to give big C negative blood until that screen is negative, in which case then you don't have to worry about it anymore because that big C volume, titer, whatever you want to call it, is finite and doesn't doesn't increase because it's not the baby's antibodies passing the antibody. Um, <clears throat> once a specimen or a unit has been transfused, the specimen has to be kept seven days post-transfusion in case there's a transfusion reaction. So you can go back and repeat your testing, and that's one of our later labs that will do transfusion reaction workups. So you want to keep it seven days post-transfusion. So technically, you probably have to keep your specimens about 10 days. You can keep them forever if you want to. You have the space and the inclination. You can keep those specimens lined up wherever you want. But the minimum amount of time that you have to keep them are 10 days. All right. So the compatibility testing has evolved over time. I think we talked about this earlier where you know, they they hooked up somebody's arm to the other person who was sick, and they gave them a little bit of blood. Are you feeling okay? Okay, we'll give us more blood. Are you feeling okay? No, you're not okay. We'll stop. Get somebody else over here. We'll try that. So basically, that was compatibility testing, but that was rudimentary compatibility testing. And then they started mixing the donor and the recipient together and putting them overnight in a human room and seeing what the reaction if there was agglutination or hemolysis, and if there wasn't. Been they would transfuse the units that look good and not transfuse the units or that didn't look good. So then it, it sort of evolved a little bit more. And initially, when um, donor units were collected, they collected whole blood because people bleed in whole blood, right? So you had um, a 450 mLs approximately, plus or minus 50 mLs, of blood. And it was probably somewhere in about the range of a 40% hematocrit. So you had, um, for every 100 mLs, you had 60 mLs of plasma, or you know, to, that you were infusing into the patient. So if you were giving O's to somebody who wasn't an O, all that anti-A or anti-B or anti-A comma B that was in that O was lysing those cells as soon as it got into that patient's system. Now, true, it was a finite amount, and the amount of cell destruction was limited, but there was cell destruction. So you were given O cells to try to make them feel better, but then they were also licensed their cells. So what they used to do when you gave O blood, and it was whole blood, and it was necessary, is they would titer the isohemoglutins to see how high the titers were. And they would only give O's to non-O people if the titers were below a certain level. So that was supposed to reduce the amount of hemolysis self-destruction that, that occurred. Um, we still do that sometimes. We still do that sometimes with platelets because the platelets we give whatever blood type we basically have. And so sometimes you, if you give enough of mismatched platelets, you can cause the patient to have a uh, positive direct antiglobular test, and it's due to the isoheme glutens that are in the platelets. So we do that chance. It's not something that is done everywhere, but we titer the isoheme glutens and the O's if we're going to give them not O people, just to make sure that we give them the lower titered O, pla o platelets. I digress. <laughs> okay, so over time, we stopped giving whole blood for everything because they found out there's, you know, there's really no need to give all this plasma. There's no, really no need to give, you know, the platelets really don't survive very well in the refrigerator, so we're just pumping a bunch of stuff in there that they don't need. So over time, they started taking the donor unit and they started spinning it down and they separated it into components. So when you gave a donation, you had a unit of red cells, you had a unit of plasma, you had a unit of cryoprecipitate, or you had a unit of platelets. And you could use those depending on what your patient's problem was. You could use them to treat the condition as opposed to just giving them a unit of blood. Well, once you reduce the amount of plasma, a unit of pack cells. Hello. Hello. I was okay. sure you were here today. I wasn't. Oh. <laughs> I was like, wait, I got molecular biology tonight anyway, and I'm heading with me. 
there on this week. So, I did not find anything like sterile laws. Do we have any non sterile laws anywhere? We used to, but I don't think we do any longer. I didn't want to waste the non sterile laws if I didn't have to do this all day. That's, that's, that's all you're using. I don't think we'll need any more. No, okay. Maybe put it on our list, but yeah, classes. is greatly reduced when you start using the component. If you had somebody that um, basically need, needed coagulation uh, factors to replenish, you could get FFP. When they found that they froze it, it retained most of the, the coagulation factors. You could get FFP. If you had a drowning victim or a burn victim, you needed plasma expanders, you could get the FFP for that. Of course, they could flip it over and kill it, but it's going to work. If you had somebody who was having trouble clotting and had a low platelet count, you could give it unit of platelets. And the platelet, you could treat the condition as opposed to just treating it with, with blood and sending somebody as a circulatory overload or something. So it's evolved over time. Back in the day when they used to give whole blood for everything, they ran um, a screen on the donor, just like we run a screen on the patient. In fact, they still do that. At the donor center, they will do a type and screen, just like you guys have done the type and screens. And so they may have a donor that has positive antibodies. Just like a, a patient may have an antibody against a low incidence antigen, the donor could have an antibody against a low incidence antigen, and you could have a situation where you have some sort of reaction. Now, the amount of plasma is finite, and it's probably diluted out by a whole lot of of other units or play the patient's own blood or whatever, but you still have the possibility of having um, a mismatch. So what they used to do when you gave whole blood is you would do what was called a minor cross-match. And you would take the donor's plasma and the patient's cells, and you would take it through a set of reactions to see if you had, had any reactivity. And if you didn't, you can get that donor to that patient. Sort of dropped that over time after we went to the pack cells. Um, after you went to the pack cells, people worried about cold antibodies, okay? Well, what happens with the cold antibody? So they started, or they what they did was they had two sets of screens. So instead of three tubes to do your screens, you had six tubes. You did one that you spun it down and you read it and you added your enhancement and you incubated it. And then you took it out and you read it, you washed it, and you added anti-hemoglobulin. And if it was negative, you had check cells. And you had the other three that you sat in your rack for 15 minutes at room temperature, and you spun it down and you read it to see if there was a cold antibody that you can't worry about. If you got reactivity, you might put it in the refrigerator for 15 minutes to see if it got stronger. Now we pretty much think, okay, if it's cold and it's not reacting at 37, we don't want to know about it. We want to just care about this, and we don't want to spend all this in order in that of time trying to work up something that's not going to affect the patient because the patient's body is never going to be 24 degrees. It is dead. She's dead. She's dead. But so why are we spending all this time and energy and resources trying to identify something that's really basically an artifact that we have to deal with and not something the patient's going to have to deal with? So um, it has evolved that way over time. The fact that you could do them, now they have IgG versus polyspecific antihemoglobulin. Initially, we only had polyspecific. Then they were able to uh, fractionate it and you guys will get IgG. So then, here again, we don't want to care about IgG antibodies. So now we can we can narrow our realm down just a little bit more. So it sort of evolved over time and um, streamlined the process and simplified it in some ways. Also making it um, more and more involved as far as the knowledge base that you have to have to be able to work through it. All right, there we go. All right, so the steps to do compatibility testing. ABO and RH, basis for everything. Okay. 
Then you're going to do the antibody screen. If the antibody screen is negative, great. If the antibody screen is positive, then you have to do antibody identification. You might have to do an antibody um, a direct anticoagulant test. You may have to do um, special testing, like changing your thermal amplitude, uh, changing your media. You may have to do special uh, steps in order to do that antibody identification. And then once you have identified the antibody, you may have to antigen type your patient or the donor or both. So once you finish that step two, then you go to the cross match. So there are different types of cross matches. The immediate spin cross match is basically you put um, your plasma and your cells in a tube and you spin it down and you read it. And if it's negative, you're happy and you say it's compatible and everybody's moving on to the next, the next patient. Now you can only do immediate spin cross matches. You can only stop at immediate spin cross matches if the patient doesn't have any antibodies now, so your screen is negative, and there's no history of the patient ever having a significant antibody. They had an insignificant antibody, it's okay, as long as the screen's negative now. But if they had a significant antibody, you can't stop at the immediate spin cross match. The next type of cross match is the Kim Space cross match. And that's your favorite thing that you get to do to wash. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to do the immediate spin. And then you are going to um, add your enhancement, incubate it, take it out, spin it, breed it, wash it, add antihemoglobulin. If it's negative, you're going to add cells, just like you do the screen. Now, you need to do cone space cross matches on patients who have a positive antibody screen. You need to do cone space cross matches if they've ever had a significant antibody identified in their plasma, regardless of whether their screen is positive now or not. You identified an anti-Big E in 1983. Patient comes in today, their screen is negative, you've got to worry about that anti-Big E because that animistic response, if you introduced big E antigen to her system, the animistic response will shoot up and the titer will be higher and faster than initially, and you'll have a transfusion reaction. The other thing that you're going to need to do a constant cross match for is if you have an AB discrepancy. So if you have a weak reaction in your reverses and you have to incubate it in your rack for 10 minutes and you spin it down and you get your reaction, you don't have to do a constant cross match. But if you have um, somebody that has reactions with A, a cells that um, you think may be an A cell group, you're going to have to do If there's uh, reactions in your B cells because of an anti-M that's reacting, and it's on room temperature, but you're going to have to do cosex cross Okay, so the third type is electronic. Um, electronic, you can only do if your antibody screen is negative and there's no history of significant antibodies. You have to have had an ABO RH type at least that was done at a different time, drawn by a different person, performed, testing performed by a different person. And for electronic cross-match, there is a ton of validation that's involved in doing electronic cross-match. Because in the first two, you're taking some of the donor cells, and you're actually serologically testing it so that you're looking at it to see if you see any compatibility. Um, with the electronic cross match, you are relying on the computer and the truth tables that are involved 
in the computer to do your testing for you. Basically, the computer system that is in the blood bank is different than any other computer system that is in the hospital. They have lines of logic and they have truth tables. As such, they are considered, considered medical devices and they are FDA reportable if they can cause, because they can cause death or serious injury to the patient. So the electronic cross match is the area where it would be very likely that you could cause death or serious injury if the validation was not performed adequately and the system didn't perform the way it should perform. Now, in order to do a validation, you write scripts up and you come up with every possible scenario and every possible situation you can come up with that you can think of and you put it in the system and you try to make it fail. If it works when it's supposed to work and it lets you issue electronic cross matches, great. If it doesn't work when it should, and it lets you issue blood, but you issue A units to an O person, for instance, then you can't use that system for electronic cross matches because there's too many, too many risks involved in that system. The electronic cross match scares a lot of people because you as in the, the blood bankers are the most anal or the most anal people in the world. Um, I think that's probably a credit to for that. But they want to see things. They don't want to rely on the computer. But it really is a handy tool to have available. It really is a fabulous thing if you can get past that initial fear of wanting to actually see the reactions for yourself and not relying on the computer. People tend to rely on the computer too much anymore. I think that that may be the problem is that you have to kind of be able to think for yourself while relying on the computer. All right, let's back up just a little bit. When you're doing cross matches, you need a sample of your donor. And donors come in bags. They used to come in glass jars, but they come in glass and bags now. And so if you entered the unit to get some of the cells out to do your testing, then you would risk the possibility of introducing bacteria. And so then your expiration date on that unit of blood would turn to 24 hours as opposed to um, the, the remainder of the 35 or 42 days, whatever's left. So they came up with this little mechanism where they have tubing that's attached to the donor cells. Um, and this allows you to get an aliquot of the donor cells without actually entering the unit of blood. So this is what we're going to use for our cross matches. This is our blood bank up here. That look nice. We're a little blood bank because we don't have to. Okay. Um, so those are our three types of, of cross matches. We're going to go into each one of them a little bit more in depth. So is everybody okay so far? Okay. The resounding head shake. <laughs> Okay, okay, we'll go back first. All right, so for immediate spin, two drops of patient's plasma, one drop of 3% cell suspension. So you're going to take this little segment and you're going to pierce it. We have little piercer things or we have scissors. Um, and you're going to squirt it into the tube. And then you're going to use your saline and you're going to make a 3 to 5% cell suspension just like you do your patients. You're going to spin, read, and record your results. If you have a positive reaction, then you're going to go and investigate why do I have a positive reaction? I really shouldn't have a positive reaction, but why do I? Um, and clear up any, any problems that you have. Now, if you have an incompatible reaction at a medium spin, it could be due to a lot of things. You could have an antibody, probably a cold, because you haven't really given it the opportunity to be able to a significant antibody to react. So a cold antibody may be there that's reacting. You could have an ADM discrepancy. I've done that before. I've typed my patient, my patient's an O, 
I got asked three or four questions before I made it over the refrigerator to pull out my donor units. By the time I got to the refrigerator, I forgot what my blood type was. I pulled A's. I took my segments off. I went back. I made my cell suspensions. I put them in the tube. I spun them down. And lo and behold, there were four plus positive. I pulled A units. <laughs> So ABO, ABO discrepancies or incompatibilities between your donor and your patient. Donor units must be reconfirmed before they are put into stock. Okay, this has been a requirement way before we had computers. They have got to be reconfirmed. They have, you don't have to do reverses, you just do forwards. And if you have a positive unit, you really don't have to do the RH on it because if it's positive and it's mislabeled as, if it's negative and it's mislabeled as a positive, you haven't really done the patient any harm. But if it's positive and mislabeled as a negative, then you could synthesize the patient. So a negative will need to have a D done on it, but a positive will not. Now, if you look in your rack, you have a new reagent that has grown in your rack, and that is the reagent called anti-A comma B. Anti-A comma B is not a mixture of anti-A and anti-B. It is an antibody that will react with either the A or the B antigen. So anti-A comma B is very, very handy to use for reconfirming donor units that are O. It cuts down on the amount of money that you have to spend because you don't recoup any money for reconfirming the donor. Um, so you only have one drop of anisterra and one two. And also there are some ABO, um, not ABO, A subgroups that the A comma B will detect that your anti-A might be negative for. So it's sort of a win-win situation when it comes to the A comma B. So, Today, when we, we do our donors, we're going to reconfirm them because this, these are brand new donors, so we need to make sure their blood types are labeled properly. Um, another thing that you can have that I didn't put up there, but it's true that you have an incompatible donor and a negative screen, and it's not an ABO discrepancy, and it's not a cold antibody that you didn't detect, um, it's very possible you could have blood. So you could have somebody with high protein concentration, and the cells are basically sticking together, they're not really positive. And so you have RULO that's causing it to look like a glutination. And if you think that this is what you have because you've eliminated all the other possibilities, you can spin your tubes down, take off your plasma, put an equal volume of saline in there. If it's true glutination, the glutination will stay. If it's due to RULO and the high protein concentration, the glutination will dispense and you'll have a negative spring or a negative we ran up against this a lot more when we started using the EDTA tubes for blood banking. We used serum not so much because it took the calcium out and we bought it. Um, but, um, I mean, the calcium was still there when we bought it. But anyway, we saw this more often with the, the protein, and I don't know exactly that there's any particular mechanism for why we saw it more with the EDTA tubes, but we do encounter more often, or at least initially more often, than we did when we were using serum. Okay, we're already there. Okay, so the next type is your Coombs phase cross match. Now, you can do it different ways. I don't want to, like, you know, limit you too much. So, in the tube, we're going to do the same steps that we did with the screen. We're going to do the immediate spin phase. Then we're going to add two drops of enhancement. And we're going to incubate at 37 degrees. If you're using albumin, we're going to incubate for at least 15 minutes. We're going to use LIS or PEG. We're going to uh, incubate for 10 minutes at least. After the incubation, we're going to spin and we're going to read and we're going to report our results, positive or negative, whatever you get. We're going to wash four times. Then we're going to add antihemoglobulin. We're going to spin it, we're going to read it, we're going to report our results. Anything that's negative, you're going to add a check cell. If for some reason 
you have a Google Space Cross Match that is incompatible and negative screens, you need to investigate your problem. If you're doing a Coombe Space Cross Match because the patient has an antibody, maybe your antibody identification is faulty. Maybe there's something else that you didn't eliminate or you didn't identify it correctly. If you've antigen typed your units, maybe the antigen typing is faulty. Maybe the unit is supposed to be antigen negative, but it really isn't. Um, and the third thing, which can possibly cause you to have an incompatible cross match with a negative screen, would be that um, you have a, well, I guess there's okay, two more. You have an antibody against a low frequency antigen that's not on the screen cell. So that's a possibility. And then the last possibility is the donor has a positive direct Coombs test. Because think about this, donors are people too. They take acetaminophen, they take drugs that can cause positive direct Coombs, and they can still donate blood. So it's entirely possible that your donor has positive direct Coombs. So you want to investigate what's going on before you issue those units. And obviously, if you get an incompatible unit, no matter what the status is of your screen, you're still not going to issue that unit. So if your screen's negative and your unit's incompatible, you don't want to send that unit out. You want to figure out why it's incompatible. Everybody good? The first step is immediate spin. The first step is immediate spin. Okay. So you're just continuing on through the same stages that you did with your screen. Okay. So most of the time, well, I won't say most of the time, but some of the time, let's say we have a history of a patient with anti B. Um, you might pull B negative units and cross match them. Now the problem is they may be incompatible. Your screen may have to be. Um, repeated because, it, or more antibody investigation may be um, needed because you've grown another antibody or something. So it's not necessarily always efficient to kind of jump the gun. People do that sometimes because they think they're saving time, but in the long run, they're really not saving themselves quite so much time as they think they are. But yeah, you do the immediate spin, and then you're going to do the same thing. Okay. Now there's another way to do a Coombs space cross match. You can do a Coombs space cross match um, using the gel. So what you're going to do in this case is you're going to do that immediate spin cross match because you're not going to be able to really detect cold antibodies too well in the gel. So you're going to do your immediate spin cross match just like you did before in the gel in the tube. And you're also going to make a 0.8% cell suspension of your donor. You're going to put 50 microliters of your 0.8% cell suspension in the gel part. Then you're going to put 25 microliters of your donor or your patient's plasma. And then you're going to incubate the gel part. Then you're going to spin the part down and you're going to read it. You're going to record it. And obviously, got a positive reaction, you're going to figure out why. Now the things that cause a positive reaction in the tube, a lot of times are going to cause the same positive reaction in the gel. So if you have a patient or a donor with a positive direct hit, or a donor that um, has uh, an antigen that's low frequency and antibody, the antibodies in the patient's body, same things are going to cause the positive in the cross match in the tube, you're going to cause it in the gel just a different method. So if somebody tells you that you have to do a Coombs space cross match, you're going to do one of these two ways, because either way is, is acceptable. And you may do one routinely and use the other one in certain circumstances. So you may do a gel screen or a gel cross match routinely for most of your patients, 
But if your patient has really strong cold antibody and you keep picking it up in your gel, even though you really shouldn't pick it up in your gel, so you need to pre-warm everything and not use LIST because LIST enhances cold antibodies, so you're going to do it in a tube, you could have that as an option and still a cocoa space cross match. That's when you need to follow your SOP for where you have to be work. Where you, either way is acceptable, but the facility itself is going to dictate what your standard protocol is going to be and when you might detour from it. Because you want to be as standardized as possible. You don't want to like jump all over the place and use whatever enhancement you like that particular day because chances are um, you're not going to get consistent results. Now when you go to electronic cross-match, those lines of logic and the treat tables that are in the system are going to, are going to do the cross-match. Um, you have to have a thorough validation and if for some reason your computer pro program is down, so you're on downtime, you're having to use paper, obviously you're not going to be able to do electronic cross-match because your reaction vessel is inoperational. Before we went to electronic cross-match, my medical director was very apprehensive of doing this sort of thing. Um, and so he wanted me to validate the truth of the, the premise that if your screen is negative, there is like a 98 point something percent chance that your cross-matches are going to be compatible if they're ABO compatible. So let's validate this to see if we think this is true. So for a year, we did kind of space cross-matches on every patient. Now you have to remember way back when, I even remember doing this, um, we did kind of space cross-matches on every single patient for every single donor that went out the door. So as you can imagine, if you had somebody, you know, within uh, an aortic aneurysm, you did a lot of work. Um, it was a major undertaking to get units out the door because half an hour was probably the minimum amount of time. And you think about how long it takes you to wash those units, take it to come space. So we started doing abbreviated cross matches where after the patient had received 10 units of blood in a 24 hour period, then we just waved the cross match and we just sent out because they had of their own blood left in their body anyway. So why are we wasting our time doing cross matches? So we're validating the electronic cross match. So for a year, we did two space cross matches on every single patient. And in that year, there was one patient who had one antibody, I believe it was KPA, that reacted within the cross match that we would not have detected because there was not KPA in the screen. So in that entire year, we transfused something like six or 8,000 units of fat cells, and we had one incompatible donor. We had a couple that were incompatible, but the donor had positive direct codes, which really doesn't count because positive direct codes, the patient could have a positive direct codes because they had a CMN. So given a donor that has positive direct codes because of the drug like that, really isn't going to cause them too much issue. But there was one antibody. KPA is very mild. It has to be heterozygous state because KPD is so high frequency. And um, if you're giving a unit, if you're giving a unit, you typically don't give one unit of blood. If you've got to give one unit of blood, there's really no reason to give a unit of blood. Let's talk about it. Um, so when you start talking about two, three, four units of blood in a day or two, then you're diluting out that KPA dramatically. And so we didn't even know. Um, well, we never tra we didn't transfuse the unit, but we would not have probably even known that they had the, they had the problem until the antibody was detected later on. So um, that sort of sold most people on the electronic cross match. Now, the good thing about electronic cross match, there's a, it's like a win-win situation when you do electronic cross match. You get tested. First of all have to have another specimen that was drawn on the patient at another time tested by another person. Okay, So you get past this whole 
the phlebotomist dr walks into the room and needs to draw bed A and draws bed B and slaps bed A's leg on bed B's blood and goes down. It goes down to the blood bank and we test the blood. And we don't do anything technically wrong, but our testing is only as good as our sample, which is why it's really important you know, when you go draw blood, make sure you've got that patient identification right. Um, so in a case like that, you would have another sample drawn at another time, and hopefully the second person would go to bed A instead of bed B, and you'd have a disparity between what your blood types were, and you'd have to investigate, okay, what's, what's my problem? So the, the situations where you have a patient who's misdrawn causing us to cross-match blood that's not really compatible for the patient at actually getting an infused are going to be eliminated because you're you're aiming for electronic cross mesh, so you're aiming for, to have that second sample, and that's going to eliminate it because it's going to be drawn by somebody else at a different time. And somebody else is going to test it. So if for some reason you got somebody who can't, you know, doesn't know the difference between anti A and anti B and does everything backwards, you know, <laughs> you get that. But um, you, you eliminate that whole technical problem, so you, you win win patient safety by electronic cross mesh. The other part is you don't have to tag units up. What we used to do is they order two units of pack cells, and we would do our cross matches. We take our units out of the refrigerator, and we put tags on them, and we put them in the cross match refrigerator, and they would sit there for three days. If they used them, fine, they would go out and get transfused. If they didn't use them in the three days, then we take the tags off and put them back in the stock refrigerator so they could go to somebody else. Well, all those units that are sitting in the refrigerator with tags hanging on them, waiting for somebody to need them, are having to be replaced in our stock refrigerator. So we're expending all this extra money getting replacements. You get somebody, let's say a liver, we set up 20 units on a liver, and the liver doesn't use 20 units, well, we've got to replace our 20 units in a refrigerator. So three days later, 18 of the 20 go back in the stock, and now we've got 38 units that we really didn't need. And we've had to buy them. So you know, you've expended money, now you don't even have space in your refrigerator for your stock. And if they expire, you have eaten the cost of them. So it's, it's really good um, use of resources. It's very good cost containment. It's patient safety. Um, when they're ready to transfuse, they send us the order saying they're ready to transfuse. We go to the computer, we do the electronic cross match, we tag them as we send them up. There's none of this tagging and sitting on the shelf waiting in case they need to use it. Now, we still have to do that if the patient has an antibody. If the patient has an antibody, we can't do electronic cross matches. So if they were two units of blood and the patient has an anti-kill, we've got to find kill negative units, do the Coombs space cross match, tag those units, and set them on the shelf for three days. We're still kind of you know, locked into that, that sort of a requirement. But as far as anybody who has a negative screen, which is the majority of our patients, we can do it on demand. And it is great for, it's a win-win. It's great for inventory control. All right. So the last one is solid phase, which I kind of don't talk about solid phase as much as I probably should. But solid phase you don't usually use for cross matches, although you might use it for screens and the reason you don't use it for cross matches is because you have to coat the wells with the cells and so we would have to take these cells and coat, coat our wells with them and then then be ready to test and that's much too labor intensive to really make it worth anybody's effort so we're not really going to ever do that. Um, 